Hi, welcome. Thank you for being here. Remember that this is the end of LJ series and that in March we have um, the Reverend Dr. Rosemary Beals working, um, talking to us, working with us with the stories of our tradition. We have um, Evelyn Underhill in May and that is oh. what we know right now. Here comes Virginia, so all will be well. And I turn things over to LJ. All right. Welcome back everybody. Thanks for coming to the last one. And let me go ahead and share my screen. Oh, thank you. It's kind of like our brains are just going, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Inch out. Here we go. All right. <clears throat> oh, yes. I like that title. Oh, good. I'm so glad. <laughs> Gospel Living, the Transformative Vision of Francis for Our World. Let's let this saying of Francis be our opening prayer. I invite you to close your eyes. Take a big, deep breath. And place yourselves in the presence of God. The truly clean of heart are those who look down upon earthly things, seek those of heaven, and with a clean heart and spirit, never cease adoring and seeing the Lord God living and true. Amen. 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 I just want to linger on this quote for a second. Again, this is from Francis's own uh, spiritual vision in a work called The Admonitions. And it's the title of the course, too, Never Cease Adoring. This is really the key to the Franciscan vision. Never cease adoring. And we're going to explore that today. But just as a quick <clears throat> recap what we talked about last week. You might remember this slide. Um, Franciscan poverty, the poverty that St. Francis lived, is captured in this Latin phrase, sine proprio, which means literally without possessing. Yes. It's first a life without possessions, both material and mental and even spiritual. It's about being subject to all for God. It's about being glad when you might fall into various trials. It's about doing and speaking well, praising God, even when you see others do evil. Better said, maybe it's the best criticism of the bad is the practice of the better. And the fifth one is to rejoice to be left with nothing, with the nothing that is God, with only God. And that last point actually launches us into the, the heart of the life, the vision, the spirituality of St. Francis. Half of his life, St. Francis spent in hermitages, he spent them often in caves above Assisi. They're called today the Carchery. You might recall when he made the first known recorded Christmas uh, manger scene, he did so at Greccio, which was another hermitage. He often spent 40 day periods, not just the 40 days of, of uh, the official Lent, but he'd make other little Lents, 40 days in the fall, in the winter, in the spring, in summer times. Um, and he'd go off to a deserted island in the middle of a small lake or out on top of a mountain like, like Laverna, where he received the stigmata. Half of his life he spent in contemplative silence and solitude. Now, I don't know if that fits with our normal image of Francis, but if you look at that picture, it's a statue which is above a CZ near the Carchery a statue of Francis in kind of a meditation pose. That's from the back. 
I don't know if that fits with the common image of Francis. That's kind of a birdbath saint, but <laughs> he really was someone who spent the majority of his time wherever he was, whether he was in a hermitage or down in the cities or in the, the uh, towns, the makeshift towns of the lepers, he spent the majority of his time as much as he could in the presence of God. That is, he spent his time consciously in God's presence. This is really the secret. <clears throat> it's the secret to any mystic. If you were with us last year or the year before, if this is the secret for Meister Eckhart, for Thomas Merton, it's having this singular vision, this, this dedicated heart, the state of mind that is empty and open to God alone. And here's just what that means. If we want to tease it out, God alone means only God is God. That is, Francis recognized God as the mystery. God alone means becoming aware of our idols, those things that are holding us back that we're choosing to love instead of God. And Francis would often put it like this to his brothers. Be careful that you don't take your mind away from God because of some <clears throat> pleasure or some benefit. God alone means becoming clear about what you desire. Francis became very clear. You might recall in the very, uh, actually it was last week, I think we, we looked at, his earlier rule, and he has this wonderful line. I believe Lisa even read it for us. Let us want nothing else. Let us desire nothing else. Let us delight in nothing else but God. God alone means receiving the gratuitous, lavish gift that is God's grace, God's love, God's mercy. Tonight, we're going to end with a prayer that, that really captures Francis's vision uh, in another way. He was caught up in the goodness of God, in God's grace and love. God alone means accepting one's inherent poverty, one's absolute need for God. And that's going to play a major part in what we talk about a little bit later. We're going to look at a story called True and Perfect Joy where Francis lets his ego be diminished, but only because he's rooted in God. You can't know God. You can't become aware of your idolatries or become clear about what you desire unless you know, I can't do it by myself. I need God. <clears throat> so this phrase also means letting God be our holiness rather than us trying to be perfect. Francis was not a moralizer. He maybe expected a basic kind of morality, but he wasn't first about admonishing people how to clean up their sexual lives or <clears throat> judge them for this or that. He never judged or punished. He was rather all about getting his brothers to fall in love with God. God alone means God is my reality, my identity, my life. It means that my prayer is all purely God. This is the secret of sanctity. And to expand on this a little bit, because it's such a key point for Francis, it so animates his life. <clears throat> I want to look at it. It's, it's actually more of an imagined conversation between Francis and his um, friend Leo. And it's two slides, I and mean, it's, it's a little bit long, but it so captures the vision, you can't help but get it. St. Francis asked his friend, Brother Leo, do you know, brother, what purity of heart is? It's not having any fault with which to reproach oneself, responded Leo without hesitating. Then you must be sad, said Francis because one always has something about which to reproach himself. Yes, said Leo, <clears throat> and it is precisely that 
which makes me despair of arriving one day at purity of heart. Oh, Brother Leo, responded Francis, don't worry so much about the purity of your soul. Turn your gaze toward God. Admire him. Rejoice in what he is. He, all holiness. Thank him because of himself. Having a pure heart is exactly that, little brother. And when you are thus turned toward God, toward God, above all, do not turn back to yourself at all. Don't ask where you stand with God. The sadness of not being perfect and finding yourself a sinner is still a human sentiment, too human. You must lift your gaze higher much higher. There is God, the immensity of God, and his unalterable splendor. The pure heart is the one which does not cease adoring the living and true Lord. It takes a profound interest in the very life of God, and it's capable, in the midst of miseries, of vibrating to the eternal innocence and to the eternal joy of God. Such a heart is at the same time overflowing and stripped. It is enough for it that God should be God. And that alone it finds all its peace, all its pleasure. And God himself is therefore all its holiness. God nevertheless demands our effort and our fidelity, observed Leo. Yes, without a doubt, responded Francis. The holiness is not an accomplishment of the self, nor a fullness which one gives oneself. It is, first of all, an emptiness which one discovers and accepts and which God comes to fill in the measure that that person opens himself to his fullness. Our nothingness, you see, if it is accepted, becomes the free space where God is still able to create. The Lord does not allow his glory to be carried off by anyone. He is the Lord, the unique, the only holy. But he takes the poor person by the hand. He pulls him out of his mud and makes him sit with the princes of his people so that he may see his glory. God then becomes the jewel of his soul. To contemplate the glory of God, Brother Leo, to discover that God is God, eternally God, beyond what we are or can be, to rejoice fully in what he is, to be in ecstasy before his eternal youth, and to thank him for himself, for his unfailing mercy. That is the most profound demand of that love which the Spirit of the Lord does not yeah, cease yeah. to pour into our hearts. That's what it is to have a pure heart. But this purity is not obtained by force of arms and by being grasping. How do you do it? demanded Leo. It is necessary simply to keep nothing of yourself. Sweep out everything, even that sharp perception of our distress. Make a clean place, accept being poor. Renounce everything that is heavy, even the weight of our faults. Have nothing more than the glory of God. Become irradiated by it. God is, that is enough. The heart then becomes light. It no longer feels itself. It has abandoned every care, every inquietude. Its desire for perfection is changed into a simple, pure desire for God. And that's how we get to the perfect joy of St. Francis. He is fully taken up in the mystery of God and not looking at himself. 
you might say there are two trajectories, or maybe even two practices in the Franciscan spiritual life, becoming irradiated by the glory of God, being taken up with the whole life of God, adoring God, and letting go of the self. Now, principally, the letting go of the self happens as we are turned toward the Lord. But it also happens in the course of daily life. And so one more story between Francis and Leo, and that'll be our longest, longest, uh, or another, another long story, but um, it'll be the last long story. <laughs> and you'll see what I mean. It's a, a little bit of a repeat from last week, but it's such a key point. I need you to, to, to make sure, I need to make sure you get it. Um, and this is such a key and, and um, traditional Franciscan story. I just read Brother Leo related that one day at St. Mary's, Blessed Francis called Brother Leo and said, Brother Leo, write. He responded, look, I'm ready. Write, he said, what true joy is. A messenger arrives and says that all the masters of, of Paris have entered the order. Right, this isn't true joy. Or that all the prelates, archbishops, and bishops beyond the mountains, as well as the king of France and the king of England, have entered the order. Right, this isn't true joy. Again, that my brothers have gone to the non-believers, converted all of them to the faith. Again, that I have so much grace from God that I heal the sick, and perform many miracles. I tell you, true joy doesn't consist in any of these things. Well, then, what is true joy? I returned from Perugia and arrived here in the dead of night. It's wintertime, muddy, and so cold that icicles have formed on the edges of my habit. It keeps striking my legs and blood flows from such wounds freezing. Covered with mud and ice, I come to the gate, and after I've knocked and called for some time, a brother comes and asks, who are you? Brother Francis, I answer. Go away, he says. This is not a decent hour to be wandering about. You may not come in. When I insist, he replies, go away. You are simple and stupid. Don't come back to us again. There are many of us here like you. We don't need you. I stand again at the door and say, for the love of God, take me in tonight. And he replies, I will not. Go to the Crozier's place and ask there. I tell you this. If I had patience and did not become upset, true joy, as well as true, true virtue, and the salvation of my soul would consist in this. That story is like this little line from Admonition 11 wound into a, into a tale. The servant of God who does not become angry or disturbed at anyone lives correctly without anything of his own. Francis is saying to us, it doesn't matter if you've given up all your material possessions. It doesn't matter if you keep going to church to pray if you're getting offended and upset at anything or everything. Because that's a sign that there's still a possession in our hearts, a possession of something. Maybe it's the possession of our dignity. Maybe it's the possession of, of um, needing to feel a certain way or maybe needing to be respected or needing you know, just a hot meal and a, and a warm bed. <clears throat> Not that those may even be bad things. It's the possession of them. It's the attachment to them. So Francis used every opportunity to let himself go. And in doing so, <clears throat> he became defenseless. He became a true man of peace. 
You see, Francis <clears throat> was not threatened by anyone or anything because he had nothing to defend. You could say he was transparent to the spirit because he had nothing holding him back. And so he could be a channel of peace. He could channel God's goodness to whoever was in his company. He could perceive the goodness of God in a negative situation, in an outsider, in the other, in the poor, even in enemies. Wherever he went, his greeting was pox et bonum, which today we translate often as peace and all good. Literally, it's just peace and good. But I guess it sounds more lyrical to say peace and all good. He was a man of peace. He was a man of peace because he was free of possessiveness, because he inhabited divine love. Living the gospel is about loving God and loving our neighbors, right? Jesus says so. The greatest commandment. Poverty is that key to loving God and neighbor. Poverty in the sense that we're left with God alone, and poverty in the sense that we're letting go of ourselves in every way possible. And we're letting every situation be a situation in which we can let go of the ego and focus on God. And when we do that, that is, when we love, we become bearers of peace. And just to give you a little bit more background, I wanted to call your attention again to these lovely couplets from the end of Francis's work, The Admonitions, where there's charity and wisdom, there's neither fear nor ignorance. Francis embodied charity and, and divine wisdom. And so he wasn't afraid. He didn't have to rely on learning. He could just go in, into a situation and be himself. Where there is patience and humility, there is neither anger nor disturbance. And that's on display in the story that we just went through. Where there is poverty with joy, Relying, relying on God, letting God be our happiness. There's neither greed nor avarice. You don't need anything else. One of my favorite lines from that first story is, God is, that is enough. And that really expresses the heart of Francis. As does the next line, where there is rest and meditation, there is neither anxiety nor restlessness. That word rest in Latin is quies, and it means not only rest, but quiet, silence, inner silence. Where there is fear of the Lord to guard an entrance, there the enemy cannot have a place to enter. Fear of the Lord, you can say, is, is a trust in God, a surrender to God that is tinged with awe. So it well expresses that ecstasy Francis experienced in being caught up in God. Where there is a heart full of mercy and discernment, there's neither excess nor hardness of heart. He was not, not one who, who went to extremes in that way. Either it's got to be all rigid or it's just all loosey-goosey. He was right down the middle and he could be flexible. As a man of peace, and as someone who embodied those couplets we just went through, he often reconciled, reconciled people, reconciled people with nature. This is a painting of the scene in Francis's life called the Wolf of Gubbio. Now you might be able to see in the top right-hand corner, there's a street sign. <laughs> That's because this painting is on a wall in downtown Philadelphia. And right out of college, I lived and worked at a Franciscan soup kitchen called the St. Francis Inn. 
and they're Franciscan nuns and sisters and Franciscan friars and volunteers. And we all um, worked together and lived on this kind of the same block in row houses. And we would work at a soup kitchen. Well, this press, this painting is on a building, an abandoned building um, on the property of the soup kitchen. And it's really, uh, it's an excellent choice for, um, for the soup kitchen because it's a place not only of poverty in, in uh, the Kensington section of Philadelphia, but a place of intense violence. A lot of drug deals, it's a lot of prostitution and a lot of um, very abusive pimps. And the story of Francis's life about the, the Wolf of Gubbio, he goes to a town called Gubbio in Italy and the town is being terrorized by a wolf. And the story is very simple. Francis goes up to the wolf, says, peace, my brother, brother wolf. And he reconciles the wolf. He pets the wolf and, and gives him something to eat. And the town and the wolf become friends. Hmm. Now, this could have been something that actually happened. But it also might be something symbolic of uh, a deeper reconciliation. Maybe there was a band of robbers that were kind of acting like wolves and terrorizing a town. But either way, Francis was able to stop the violence, not by attacking the wolf, but by offering the wolf peace. And so even to this day in downtown Philadelphia and Kensington, the Franciscans there are a presence of peace amidst the violence of poverty and drug deals and, and just a ruined section of Philadelphia, really. Um, but it's not a let's attack the problem, uh, the approach of let's attack the problem and make things happen. We're just going to offer peace. So Francis did that. He was able to do that because he was caught up in adoring God. And he could perceive the goodness of God in the wolf, as well as in the scared villagers of Gubbio. But there's more. You'll recall from the class we did on his life that Francis was a part of one of the Crusades. Now, he didn't go to fight. He went to go preach to the Muslims. But when he got to Damietta, Egypt, where the crusade was happening, he got horrified, horrified with the war. He saw what the Muslim army was doing to the Christian army and what the Christian army was doing to the Muslim army, and he condemned the whole of it. But instead of, again, attacking, he decided he would cross the line uh, between the Muslim army and the, and the Christian army and go and talk to the sultan himself and preach the gospel to the sultan. So that's what this painting is. Francis preaching to the sultan. Now, normally, uh, if that happened, you would be, he would have been martyred on the spot. But he happened to meet a very open-minded sultan. And in fact, what he, what he did was he got to know the sultan <coughs> and became his guest. Again, just by offering peace. But also because Francis, in this experience, and maybe it was only once he was in the presence of the Sultan, could perceive the goodness of God there too. In the centuries old, quote, enemy of Christendom, in, in the, the looked down upon Muslim armies and most of all, the Sultan. Right before we started, uh, you might notice when we get back out of, out of our PowerPoint, Russ has a picture of Jerusalem behind him. And he was telling me about how he went to Jerusalem and uh, he was taking a tour there and they kept, the tour kept getting interrupted by processions. The tour was on Good Friday. And one of the processions had a bunch of Franciscans. The Franciscans are the caretakers of a lot of Holy Land shrines and it dates back to this story the, for that the Sultan gave a special privilege to Francis and his brothers to travel around the Holy Land while the Muslim armies occupied it. Now, I'm, there's a connection there I'm missing. I'm not sure how it wound up that the Franciscans then 
got a hold of like all the real estate in, <laughs> in Israel or the prime Christian real estate at least. But that tradition of the Franciscans holding on to certain key holy sites dates back to this story. And again, Francis was the only Christian, well, him and his brothers, that were able to penetrate the Muslim line. The armies could not do it. Peace did it. And this is kind of what I just told you. <laughs> and it was on June 24th um, that they went down there, by the way. It was uh, 12, it was 1221, I think, or 1220. Oh, and the Sultan's name was Al Camille. But again, there's more. Nearing death, Francis moved to a small hut near San Damiano. And for two months, his friends recalled, he stayed inside in that dark little cell. This was that time when he was um, assaulted by a number of illnesses. And so the story continues in the second bullet point. He was unable to bear the light of the sun during the day or the light of the fire at night. He had constant severe pain in his eyes. And at night, he could scarcely rest or sleep. Some people think he caught um, a rare eye disease while he was in Egypt. After one particularly painful, exhausting night, he called one of his brothers over and said excitedly that he wanted to compose a new song. I want to write a new praise of the Lord for his creatures, which we use every day and without which we cannot live. We are minstrels of the Lord, he wanted his friars to say. What are the servants of God, if not his minstrels, who must move people's hearts and lift them up to spiritual joy? Here is that song. The Canticle of the Sun. And if you will, we have a few moments. I invite you to pray this with me. Um, everybody can be, either if you're muted, you can just kind of say it on your own, or you can just listen. Um, I'll read it out loud, so maybe no one else read it out loud, but close your eyes, take a deep breath, and listen to the prayer of St. Francis, the Canticle of the Sun. Most high, all-powerful, good Lord, yours are the praises, the glory, and the honor, and all blessing. To you alone, most high, do they belong, and no human is worthy to mention your name. Praise be you, my Lord, with all your creatures, especially Sir Brother Son, who is the day, and through whom you give us light. And he is beautiful and radiant with great splendor, and bears a likeness of you, Most High One. Praise be you, my Lord, through sister moon and the stars. In heaven, you form them clear and precious and beautiful. Praise be you, my Lord, through brother wind and through the air, cloudy and serene, and every kind of weather through whom you give sustenance to your creatures. Praise be you, my Lord, through Sister Water, who is very useful and humble and precious and chaste. Praise be you, my Lord, through Brother Fire, through whom you light the night, and he is beautiful and playful and robust and strong. Praise be you, my Lord, through our Sister Mother Earth who sustains and governs us, and who produces various fruit with colored flowers and herbs. Praise be you, my Lord, through those who give pardon for your love and bear infirmity and tribulation. Blessed are those who endure in peace, for by you, Most High, shall they be crowned. Praise be you, my Lord, through our sister bodily death, from whom no one living can escape. Woe to those who die in mortal sin. Blessed are those whom death will find in your 
most holy will. For the second death shall do them no harm. Praise and bless my Lord and give him thanks and serve him with great humility. Amen. Now, this is a, uh, a wonder of Italian poetry and mysticism. Actually, it's one of the first things written in kind of an uh, ancient version of Italian. It wasn't written in Latin, which most, other, most of Francis's other works were. But you'll notice, besides the first paragraph and the last line, which are dedicated exclusively to God, he goes through praising God for all these different aspects of creation. And then he gets to the, to the second and uh, third and second to last paragraphs, and he shifts a little bit. He praises God for the sun, the moon, the stars, the wind, weather, water, fire, earth. And then he says, praised are you, my Lord, praised be you for those who give pardon for your love who bear infirmity, tribulation, those who endure in peace. He actually wrote up to the stanza about Mother Earth and left it at that. And then there was a, a very large and disruptive dispute between the mayor of Assisi and the bishop of Assisi. And Francis inserted that paragraph. He wrote that new paragraph and then sang it. And the story goes, that's when the mayor and the bishop became friends for their lives. And right before he died, he wrote the second to last stanza, where he praises God for death. And notice how he talks about death. Death is our sister. Just like the earth is our sister, just like the sun is our brother. He sees everyone and everything as a part of a great big family, a family that is rooted in God and that is related to each other. He has gone beyond the oppositional mind. He is at one with God and through God, creation. He's one with the birds and the flowers, dogs and cats, rabbits and owls, and cardinals and cacti, and sun and moon and stars. But it's not because of anything he did. It's because he never ceased adoring God. That's the key. That's the key to, to Christian mysticism in general. That's the key to the gospel. God is. That is enough. All right. I think we're ready for some small group time. Oh, that was an abrupt end. Yeah, but I understand what you're saying, Kathy, and you, that, that's right. So I mean, that is a problem. Sorry. Oh, yes, I agree. I, I, I didn't want to continue the conversation I think, publicly. That's okay. <laughs> Let us in on what you're talking about. We're struggling, yeah. with, we're struggling <laughs> with these highfalutin ideas and how to take it down into um, and, and how to um, make it play. It, it sounds very good while we're sitting here in front of our laptops. But when it comes to, well, I don't know, he, uh, we were, well, one of the things that came up is what happens, a young man is, uh, graduates from high school, he's drafted, sent to war and told to um, bomb villages or, you know, kill people. And how do you, um, how do you mesh that with the adoring God all the time? And then he comes back into, you know, back, back stateside and he's supposed to be fine and um and we're constantly conf we're confronted with things that are violent or <laughs> ugly and how do we respond and um in an effective way in a loving way 
in yeah. a way that Francis would have. Um, and but that happens. I mean, that's it's not only us. This has happened throughout the history of mankind. Yes. So it's but it you know it just there there are challenges. Um, we're put in very bad. So you know sometimes we're in situations we. Well, yeah. So how do you respond think, lovingly and adoringly? <clears throat> that was one example that came up. I think one of the dimensions here, just to finish up a little bit, is the the issue of perception. That is, um, I have a very specific political persuasion. Okay, and there are individuals who have a very different political persuasion. We both feel that we are right. And our sense of rightness <clears throat> is generated both by by our environments that we've lived in and the experiences of other people that we've had mm -hmm. and the experiences especially of people above us to tell us what we have to do or should do or are right if we do and that they aren't the same and so when we look at somebody who's very who has the opposite point of view mm -hmm. when i look at somebody who has the opposite point of view <clears throat> i can't understand why they have that point of view. I can't understand it. I can't get to the roots of their experience that form that attitude and that perception. I can see some of the things that would lead a person there. I can identify them and we practice them with Lee. Um, we, I mean, our, our system of drafting and indoctrinating the soldiers that come in into this doctrine of what what they're supposed to do and what they have to do and why obedience is important and why loyalty to the flag is important and other such things. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a basis for mutual understanding um, because then it comes down to what's the flag supposed to mean? What do you mean by the flag? What do I mean by the flag? Do we mean the same thing? And the answer is no. It comes down to our school education. How much is the loyalty to our school teaches us to be loyal to the power that's over us? Should we be loyal to our school as opposed to the one that's five miles away? Whose students are supposed to be loyal to their school? How does that loyalty, what does loyalty mean if they're right to be loyal to theirs and I'm right to be loyal to mine? Or maybe we should both be disloyal it's very much not easy to make the country. It's not easy to make the transition from the abstraction to down to the concrete. And we can see that popping up in certain ways. For example, in the reading tonight, we had the person, we had Francis being angry because of, the, of something that was happening to other people. But the anger then is contradictory to you. You will never have anger or you'll never be disturbed. But there are places where we should be angry and disturbed. Mm -hmm. and so, as, so we don't understand what he's saying if we think we shouldn't be angry and disturbed at certain things. So <clears throat> at the end of his life, Francis, one of the last things he said to his brothers was, I have done what is mine to do, now do what is yours. So I take that to mean, instead of getting caught up in scenarios that we spin in our minds, I just got to start with my life. You know, we could, we could talk about this, the soldier who comes back from abroad and is, is basically indoctrinated in a certain way of life and is traumatized. But unless that's my experience, I just say, start with your own life. That's what Francis did. He just got very concrete. And by the way, even though he preached this, he of course didn't live it 100% perfectly. <laughs> so he says, um, yeah, if you get upset about anything, you are likely not living poverty to the fullest. But maybe there's a little give there when it comes to being horrified at the, 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 there's the, the, the worst parts of war, you know? Because um, I think he generally means that you don't get upset kind of in the daily course of events when you interact with people. 
But yeah, I think you're right in saying there are some things that just horrify us in a really human way. Like we're, that they're just revol revolted by certain experiences because they're so deeply against life or humanity or the earth, you know. Um, so I just say, you know, start with your own life. And if you want to make it very concrete, very, very concrete. This is what Francis did. He prayed. That was it. That was his first thing. He didn't go and start giving away his possessions first. He first prayed. So that, what I'm saying, when I'm saying that Francis is telling us to, to never stop adoring God, we're talking about really a state of mind, a state yeah. of consciousness. Yeah. Start there. And at least I found when I start there, I'm not as concerned with how this fits into my life because it just becomes my life. And so I can start making decisions and acting from that different mindset, you know, <clears throat> rather than the indoctrinated mindset that I grew up with. I don't know, I don't know where all of you folks grew up. I grew up in Long Island and <laughs> in the 80s. And that was very much the mindset of, you know, greed is good. And it's not that my parents said that to me, not at all. But the actions of their actions, the actions of my friends and my family, and then my extended family, and just kind of the actions of the whole country at the time just said, greed is good, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, and, and Francis kind of grew up similarly, thinking greed is good. And that's mm -hmm. how, and then honor is good. And then he just says, no. That doesn't matter. What matters is God. And if God matters, and if God is, is this one who died on a cross for me, that totally reorients my whole value system. But he fell in with God first. I think that's, that's probably why, I, why he became a saint. That is why he became a saint. It's not about the poverty. It's not about the leopards. It's not about the peace. It's you first get involved with God. And that's why he's a mystic, you know? Um, I, I don't know if that helps, but that's, that's at least how I've started to look at Francis. You can't live Francis's life. Francis lived that. How do you live these values? I think <clears throat> a really very practical way to start is by inhabiting the, the state of mind called prayer. Yeah, I think that's, that's me fine. think of something, Lal Jay, that, that I, I think I seem seeing a connection to the conversation that we had. We were talking about meditation. This won't sound related, but it feels related. Um, we were talking about that, how if we want to have that groundedness in God and that closeness and that relationship and that sort of God first, God all the time thing. Mm -hmm. And we talk a lot about meditation and we hear a lot about meditation being a way to do that. How do I get to that quiet place so that I know how to be in that place mm -hmm. of union? And of course, half of that conversation ends up being the frustration of whether we actually get ourselves into a meditation practice and do we actually do it and, and we want to and we're not. But you're making me think so I can look at Francis and go, yep, can't do that. Never going to quite make that. Mm -hmm. But this idea of being in the face of something that is abhorrent to us or whatever, it's something we receive negatively or mistreatment or behavior that we see as wrong or bad. What if the one little piece I can hold on to is a, to stop? So in face of whatever the thing is, if I can get myself in, myself in the habit of a 10 second meditation, a 15 second meditation, the pause. If, if I see this thing in front of me and my normal reaction would be react, act out against that. Mm -hmm. That's bad. That's wrong. That's not good. And I, and I get into my daily life mode and I, I snap on that. What if the little tiny thing I can ask of myself is to, to say, notice what that feels like in your body when you're going to do that thing, breathe, stop, then see what you do next. And so that I can, I can ask that of myself and I'm still going to fail plenty, but I can ask that of myself to take that pause in the face of something that feels wrong or bad so that it's the God pause, right? That yeah. says, who did you decide you were going to be? Yeah. This is who you decided you were going to be. And this is who you decided you were going to try really hard not to be. Yeah. That's, that's a that's great good. way to apply the, the spirituality of Francis to daily life. You know, it's, it would, it would equally be finding a time in your day that is rather low key, you know, uh, about the only low key time in my life is when I drive. 
without my family <laughs> to work <laughs> and home from work, you know? So for that, like 20, 25 minutes, mm -hmm. I mean, I could listen to music, I could listen to the, the NPR, or I could take in the silence. You know, I've had some really mystical moments driving on Route 29 up here in Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> because I just like turned off the radio mm -hmm. and just became present. Yeah. Do you, do, you, do you folks know Eckhart Tolle? Oh, yeah. In another word, this is presence. This is what we're talking about. We're talking mm -hmm. about simple mm -hmm. presence or, or, you know, the way to put it is mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Although I do like, yeah. uh, if you know Thomas Keating, he calls it heartfulness. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that equally, I right. think, captures what we're talking about here. Right. Just to be right. this moment. So that phrase I picked out from the very first longer story, God is, that is enough. Mm -hmm. That's all I have, right? That's actually what poverty is. Mm -hmm. All I have right here, right now, is the presence of God, which is not a thing, which is not even something I can possess. It's more like the air that the second I try and capture it, you know, mm -hmm. I suffocate. <laughs> I can't quite hold on to air. I can't at all hold on to air, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's this exercise in joyful detachment, but all because, if you want to use that word detachment, I am attached to divine love. LJ, I think that's really important. As you've been speaking at it, and people have been talking, I've been thinking about Jesus says, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God, not to be righteous or anything like that, but when you do that, everything else flows from that. Yeah. Uh, I think for me, that's what I hear in Francis, that exactly. never see glory. Because everything flows from that, that relationship. Um and you empty yourself into that relationship and everything else flows from that. Um, so I, 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 that's what I hear, and, you know, and it's, and I, we're talking in our group, it doesn't matter if we're not perfect at it. it it's, it's, not, it's not about perfection. It's about simply being in relationship. I see, that's what Francis discovered and only a little bit later in his life, <clears throat> that story that we heard about true joy you know, he's, he's like covered in mud and icicles and he gets thrown out of the Priory. It's actually kind of a parable about the last few years of Francis's life when the order kind of uh, in their own minds outgrew Francis. So you heard the, the, the brother at the door say to Francis himself, we don't need you, you're stupid. We, we don't like you, get out of here. <laughs> it's because they wanted to be power brokers. They wanted to be among the high ranking clerics in medieval society at that time. And Francis didn't have an education. You know, he could really barely write or read. You know, he had Leo do most of his writing, even though he, he spoke it, he would have Leo do the actual writing. Um, he was a simple man and the brothers wanted to become something great. And they missed out on Francis's vision. No, 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 we stay little. We stay little because that corresponds to the humility of God. Even though he calls God most high, he also got the intuition from the gospel based on crib and cross that God is about humility, which he calls poverty's twin sister. Poverty and humility. Staying dependent and little and, and shunning those positions of authority because they tend to, you know, that, what is that phrase? Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Even a little bit of power <laughs> can be a little, even a little bit of corruption. You know? <laughs> um, and so Francis said, no, those can be just as much attachments as any, any material possession. So don't even seek an office. Don't, you know, an office as a work to be done, like preaching or holy orders or, don't seek any of that. All you are to seek, brothers, sisters, all you are to seek is the Lord God. That's it. That's a real simplicity and purity to that. Because <laughs> I don't know about you, but I found in my own life, even though I want God, I also found, oh, I kind of don't want God. I want these other things too. 
You know, I want, I want a nice life. I want to be comfortable. You know, I want, um, I want to have a beer at night and, and watch the Sopranos, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I have, a, you know, I, you want, we want all the, all sorts of things. Not that any of that is bad. That's not the point. Is that Francis's heart was so captured by the divine. Or like you said, Peg, he poured himself out. He emptied himself into that relationship. That's a really wonderful way to put it. Yeah. That everything else, everything needful will be given. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, but yeah, everybody I, can't live like that if he doesn't want any office. Somebody has to be in charge in the world. <laughs> <laughs> we think somebody has to be in charge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. We, but. Uh, and I, no, I think I love that point. And I think um, sort of, uh, LJ, what you said earlier, like Francis saying, I've done mine to do, now what's yours to do? And I think somebody who, uh, you know, belongs in the office, uh, they'll, they'll, take all these beautiful qualities of poverty and humility, staying simple, attached to divine love, joyful detachment, God is, and they can do that in the office and they can sort of redefine office space, office work. And um, so I think where, whatever your gifts are, that is where the hope is. Yeah. Um, whatever comes easily for you, that's where the hope is. That's, that is, uh, exactly what the world is waiting for whatever comes easiest for you and, and and if that is in the office like if that's organizing and and um promoting other people and setting structures so people can thrive that's exactly what the world needs yeah um, good point brilliant benjamin <laughs> well put it, it needs bishops who, who don't want to be bishops mm. it needs presidents who were really in awe of the job and are very reticent to even take it you know mm -hmm. it's that i think that's a well-made point yeah yeah it's it's um it's just that francis was was very aware for his brothers he, he i think he knew into that there had to be somebody in charge but he, he at least thought for his brothers because in that society the clerical privileges were so tempting and they were among the only privileges. Yeah, yeah. Unless you were the nobility. So he had guys joining him who were from the peasantry. Yeah, so yeah. You can imagine, I could all of a sudden have these clerical privileges that put me in touch with emperors and popes. I think he was very aware of that temptation, tried to show them a different path. But today, yeah, today, obviously today is different. And, you know, I'm in charge of, of certain ministries at my parish here in Silver Spring. Um, so, yeah, I have a certain level of power. You know, I'm sure that each of you um, in your jobs or if you're retired, you know, in your former jobs had a certain degree of power. But it's not, it's not necessarily about being afraid of power, I think, today. But like you were saying, Benjamin, just how are we going to use power? What, what qualities and gifts are we going to bring to that? Can we bring detachment into that? Even, you know, the detachment that Lisa was talking about, right before someone, you know, someone is about to say something, you know it's coming, they're gonna say something that is gonna be completely off base and you, and you don't like what they're gonna say. If you know ahead of time that what they're gonna say you're not gonna like, can you take a breath? Center on God for a few moments, a few seconds, even just a, a millisecond. That might make a difference. Take Lisa's recommendation. Yeah, take Lisa's <laughs> recommendation. Yeah. Great recommendation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wish I did it all the time, too. <laughs> <laughs> or, or again, downtime. You know, that's, I, I found it a very simple, simple way. If you have some downtime, you know, like you're waiting in the doctor's office. Well, I guess you're not waiting in a doctor's office anymore. You're waiting <laughs> to log on to telehealth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or I, I, I live right across from the Howard County Hospital. I see a line of cars to get the vaccine. If you're waiting for the vaccine, that's some good downtime where you can, you know, go into the adoring mode where you can just have a little quiet time for prayer. Not to the point. Other comments or questions before we go? This was very good. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Yeah,